Great. Um, so, um, on behalf of the HKUSD Institute for Emerging Market Studies, uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to today's, today's event. Uh, my name is Sujata Visaria. I'm Acting Director of the IEMS. Uh, today's event is one of several events around the world to launch the World Development Report 2019. The World Development Report, as you may know, is the World Bank's best known annual publication. Each year, uh, a World Development Report is published on a topical theme related to economic development, uh, and it presents an analysis of this theme by examining in detail projections, uh, trends, causes, consequences, and implications of the phenomenon. Uh, it relies on large amounts of state-of-the-art academic research, uh, as well as in-depth analysis by in-house researchers. It involves consultations with civil society, interest groups, business groups, and other multilateral organizations as well. Uh, and most importantly, perhaps, it provides guidance for business leaders and policymakers around the world. Um, at the HKUSD IEMS, which is the Institute for Emerging Market Studies, our mission is to facilitate research as well as engagement on key challenges that policymakers and businesses face in emerging markets. The themes that we work on range from entrepreneurship to innovation to financial development to jobs and human capital. And so I think it is fitting that we are hosting the World Bank today uh, as they launched the 2019 World Development Report, the title of which is The Changing Nature of Work. Uh, this report focuses on whether changes in technology, mainly in manufacturing and in services, are changing the types of jobs that are available now and will be available in the future. And if so, what these changes will be and how countries can prepare for these changes. Uh, the World Development Report today will be presented by Dr. Simeon Jankov, who is sitting here, who is a director of the WDR 2019 team. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Jankov. Uh, he has had an illustrious career spanning academia, multilateral organizations, as well as government. Uh, he has taught at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He has been rector of the New Economic School in Russia, and he directed the Financial Markets Group at the London School of Economics. Uh, he has been Chief Economist of the Finance and Private Sector Vice Presidency of the World Bank, and he is very well known for founding the World Bank's Doing Business Project. At the World Bank, he has worked on topics ranging from regional trade agreements in North Africa, enterprise restructuring and privatization in transition economies, corporate governance in East Asia, and regulatory reforms. He was also, last but not least, Bulgaria's Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance from 2009 to 2013. So let me now invite Dr. Jankov so he can make the presentation. Thank you, Sujata, and thank you for everybody spending uh, part of your Friday with, um, with us. Um, let me see what I can... I'll need some help on this. Um, while uh, I get the help, uh, let me mention that um, for the first time actually in uh, this World Development Report, uh, made some innovations in the way that it was both prepared uh, and um, presented. So for the first time uh, since uh, World Development Report started about 50 years ago, um, we decided to use uh, new technology, online technology, and actually were weekly, every Friday, putting, um, putting drafts of the report for comments. And over the last about six, seven months, we collected uh, nearly 6,000 comments uh, from around uh, the world. Initially very angry comments, then not so angry comments, uh, and now there's kind of a mixture between um, uh, positive uh, uh, and uh, angry comments, but also very constructive comments where firms, students, um, uh, academics, business people, government sometimes were suggesting topics of, well, you should be covering this, you should be covering that, you're not really saying how things really work in development or in advanced economies and so on. So this open process, uh, which was really kind of an experiment, we didn't know what to expect, will be followed now, will be followed now in the future, our board has decided for future world development reports and for some of the other major publications of um, of the World Bank. Um, so hopefully that uh, brings uh, some more um, uh, experience, global experience, uh, and comments early on 
in World Bank publications. Uh, and likewise, partly from this, uh, from this um, comments partly from our travels around the world, we tried, uh, as we write this report, not just to get the latest academic knowledge, because frankly on this topic there is not too much uh, rigorous research yet, but to get lots of examples by companies, cities, governments, um, uh, like real examples of what, uh, what is being done. Um, uh, and that's the reason why we started uh, this year's um, launch of the report from China. This is our third stop, uh, or from East Asia. Um, uh, usually you start in Washington DC or somewhere in Europe. We decided to start um, in East Asia because many, many of the examples that I'll show you some in a moment, uh, but also in the report, of technologies affecting the future of work actually come from this, uh, uh, from this uh, uh, region. So actually China and India are the two most cited countries uh, in, the, in the report, several times more than examples from the United States or Germany. Uh, or some other uh, countries. So what I plan to do in about 25 minutes is uh, run through some of the main topics. Um, it's a fairly large uh, study with a lot of uh, different topics, um, so I'll be skipping some. Uh, but just to give you a, a flavor of what, um, uh, what the report is about and then open it for comments. So let me start by saying that uh, this topic, the future of work or the changing nature of work, has been um, kind of on the forefront of policy discussions and some academic discussions in the last few years. Uh, and uh, the take on future of work has been relatively negative. In other words, if you just Google future of work, of the first 100 articles, probably 85 will, will say the future of work is bleak, robots will destroy jobs, there will be mass unemployment, uh, income inequality will rise, and social riots will follow roughly speaking. So therefore, we need many, many things so that this does not happen. But then when you ask what are the things that we need, it's not really clear. Uh, so it's more of a big warning um, uh, signal, but then uh, um, not, not too much on the policy side. So what we've tried to do, uh, since one of the strengths of the World Bank is that we have offices in about 140 countries, so we can collect a lot of data and evidence. Very few other organizations are able to do this in development, at least. Um, so one thing that the report uh, has adds value is just to ask uh, um, factually uh, to, to, to put these questions to the test. One, is it true that new technology is displacing workers, basically is... Uh, likely to lead to mass unemployment, yes or no, what's the evidence? And two, is it true that income inequality is increasing uh, around the world since the advent of this fourth industrial revolution, the advent of uh, internet uh, technology in the last 15 years or not, yes or no? And then we have a number of more subtle questions than that. Um, so I'll start with answering these two uh, uh, questions and start with some um, economic theory of, uh, of sorts. So when we were asking actually this main question of what the future of work is, uh, it's uh, good to know uh, what, uh, what viewpoint you're asking this question from. Uh, and I should say that the report covers every country in the world, so it's not just about developing countries, it also covers advanced economies. So in advanced economies, especially the US where I would say 95% of the research uh, on future of work currently at least uh, uh, sits, uh, the main preoccupation of both academics and policy makers, including the current US administration, is uh, on this topic, which is that there are a number of, we call them old industries, established industries. And in these industries, due to automation, um, a number of jobs are being uh, replaced by or displaced by, um, uh, by robots. So if you think of this, um, of this square as kind of the sum total of... Um, of uh, the various old industries and you line them up on in terms of most uh, affected by technology, least affected by technology. What we show at the top uh, is that uh, automation displaces a large number of workers in some industry, let's say the car manufacturing industry, um, uh, and then le uh, fewer workers in, uh, in some other industries, but there is a substantial share of, uh, of workers and it's documented, various studies document how large that uh, share is. 
I should note in passing that these uh, studies are very imprecise, so they give some very wild estimates from, you know, everybody is going to be displaced by robots to not so many people are going to be displaced by robots. We try to specify a bit. But it's important to note that if you are having the discussion of future of work in the US and in the UK in particular, which happen to be the two largest academically active um, uh, societies on this topic, essentially you're discussing this how many workers are going to be displaced, and then what can governments do about that. And at the extreme, you basically say we're going to stop technology, so we're going to prevent technology from displacing workers in various communist ways. Um, or, uh, you know, we're going to find uh, ways to retrain these workers for, for other jobs. That, by the way, in our report, we also show, unfortunately, doesn't really work very well. Um, if you, however, um, think of the rest of the world, um, a lot of the discussion is not on, uh, on old jobs and old sectors, but it's actually on new sectors and how innovation, which is another side of uh, technology, creates opportunities for new sectors being created and new jobs. So our report actually gives examples from both. Many of the examples that do not at least so far exist in the literature, uh, some are known, like the um, Alibaba and this type of examples are well, uh, uh, well known in the literature, but we bring about 200, 250 examples around the world of companies or sectors that use new technology basically to create new markets or to expand markets that previously did not, uh, 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 did not exist. So in terms of uh, just uh, stylized facts, a lot of uh, what we bring is innovation leading to new employment in new, um, in new sectors. Um, so, so let's then have a, a bit of a discussion with some uh, of the latest numbers on what is changing. Because remember that one of the claims is that, um, that a lot of jobs are being destroyed due to, um, uh, to technology. We actually first document, uh, I'm not showing it uh, in these slides, in fact how many jobs on net get created or get destroyed every year. And we find out that on average over the last 15 years, about 40 to 60 million jobs on net get created around the world. So it's not true that the robots are, on average, at least displacing workers. There is still a very healthy um, job creation um, um, that exists uh, in the world. Then the next question, which is also politically very relevant, is where are these jobs being created? So who is getting jobs and who is not getting jobs? So this picture relates somewhat to this um, uh, second uh, question. This is not total number of jobs. This is share in industrial employment. Uh, but the reason I'm showing this um, uh, slide rather than others is that it fits very well in the discussion of, uh, well, among other things, I think it explains very well the current trade war um, I don't know how to call it, controversy between the United States and the rest of the world, but particularly um, uh, China. Why? Because if you're the United States, um, you look at the top graph, so if you're a politician in the United States, you look at the top, uh, sorry, the top um, um, trend, uh, the yellow line, and basically you say, ah, so in rich countries like the United States, we're actually proportionately losing jobs in manufacturing. And then East Asia actually is proportionately gain, uh, gaining jobs in manufacturing. So it's true, in fact, that our workers get um, displaced, uh, and then um, these jobs go to, um, uh, to East Asia. I should note here that actually, to make the point that this is not about China, China is excluded from the graph at the bottom. So it does not, uh, uh, it's, so this is all of East Asia minus China. So this is Vietnam, Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. But note for, for, this is the dotted line, for the world as a whole, actually the share of industrial uh, employment is remarkably stable. So if you take the world as a whole and ask the question, are robots in manufacturing replacing workers? The answer is actually no, they are not. Or if they are in some sectors, in other sectors, jobs for humans are being created. So on average, the share, if you like, the ratio of humans to robots in, um, in global manufacturing is, um, is remarkably uh, stable. Who is losing jobs? So within the OECD, within the rich countries at the top, one may conclude, and in fact a lot of the uh, academic work has taken for granted that whatever happens in the US and UK must be true for the rest of the OECD countries. So we unpack that and basically find out that the downward trend 
is entirely, ex entirely explained by three countries, US, UK, and Australia. So if you remove these three countries from the OECD, uh, the trend actually would be even. So some countries are gaining, in fact, jobs. So Germany, Switzerland, all of Central Europe, Central Europe meaning Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, are in fact gaining manufacturing employment still. So it's a feature of Anglo-Saxon countries, rich Anglo-Saxon countries, um, that uh, we can go into uh, later on, but seems to be uh, explaining a lot of the relative uh, job loss um, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in manufacturing. Now, what's most worrying from this, and I think the top part of this chart can be used a lot to explain the political economy of trade wars, various other geopolitical um, skirmishes, and so on. From the perspective of the World Bank, actually, the bottom, the low-income um, trend is actually most worrying, because what it's showing, so who is in the bottom? So this is all of Africa, much of Latin America, all of South Asia, and much of the Middle East is in the low-income category. So what that is showing is that these countries proportionately actually not gaining manufacturing jobs. And that's why is that worrying from an economist's point of view? Because if you believe kind of the standard development economic story, as countries like China get richer, a lot of the manufacturing jobs, but also service jobs that are in, in this type of countries will trickle down. So they'll go from China to Vietnam, from Vietnam to Egypt, Egypt to Ethiopia, and, uh, and so on. That we document, not just with this graph, with a lot more um, uh, data, is actually not happening. Whatever jobs globally are being created, basically get stuck, so to speak, in East Asia. So on net, we're gaining jobs globally, but the vast majority of these jobs come to East Asia. And we can discuss uh, in a minute why that might be, might be the case. Shifting slightly gears to then um, often another part of the literature on, um, on industrial revolutions, on technological advance, asks this very relevant actually question of, um, so what's different this time? Because we have had previous industrial revolutions, the advent of the steam engine, electricity, the computers in the 1970s. So um, especially in the business school literature, this the current period, uh, which is the internet period, uh, so to speak, is known as the fourth industrial revolution. And at least in economics, the previous three periods are quite well researched. So we know what happened uh, when electricity was introduced or when computers came in terms of productivity, in terms of technological advances, uh, wage increases, and, uh, uh, and so on. So one question to ask is, what's different this time? So this new technology, what does it do that previously was not uh, done? And there are a number of answers, but one answer is hopefully represented by this picture, which is that... Online technology, the internet, allows a company, actually not just a company, either a business idea or a social idea, uh, idea that changes society, to develop in a very short period of time, become a regional or global phenomenon. So I demonstrate here three well-known countries, uh, sorry, companies, IKEA, Walmart, um, uh, and Taobao, part of um, the Alibaba group, to demonstrate that in a very short period of time, a dozen years at most, uh, Alibaba, or Taobao rather, uh, this online platform, completely dominates uh, some more traditional, if you like, uh, um, business models. And this type of picture, or this type of story, as I mentioned, we have in a number of other sectors, because somebody can say, well, that's very specific about China. Um, so it's a large underdeveloped market, somebody comes with a new technology and basically takes the whole market. So maybe this is a China story, it's not it's not a development story. For that reason, we have many examples, let's say, of a bookseller in, uh, in Jordan. You know, Jordan is one of the smaller Middle Eastern um, uh, country, countries that uh, provided or developed an online platform for selling books and magazines in Arabic. In a period of about eight years, they dominate 70 to 80 percent of the whole market for publishing, printing and publishing in the Middle East. And these are 15 or so countries, not just uh, uh, Jordan. And in a number of other areas, we have such uh, examples. So it's not just about uh, China, and it's not just about, um, uh, about um, 
uh, sale, sales of, uh, of consumer goods. There are a number of other sectors where this, uh, this technology is very, um, uh, very useful and spreads very quickly. Why does it spread very quickly? Basically because you don't need physical assets or you need very few physical assets and you can transcend boundaries through e-payments, through marketing and sales and so on without having to have offices in every one country. So that's why it took 75 years for IKEA because, you know, the strategy was in every country you establish a representative office, you establish a warehouse, uh, you establish local knowledge and eventually you move to the next country and so on. Now you can simultaneously basically take over, uh, take over the world. And we demonstrate this across sectors and across different types of um, uh, countries. Um, so then a next question is, we have a technology that allows certain, t certain firms, and by the way, we also document where these firms come from. So from the largest hundred currently available um, online platforms, it's a very kind of uh, duopolistic model. More than half come from China or, or uh, Chinese uh, companies, let's say 50, 52 of the top 100. Another close to 40 come from the United States, and less than 10 come from Japan, Europe, the rest of the world. So one question, which we do not answer well in this report, but hopefully over time we'll answer, is on the one hand, I just told you that this technology can easily spread around the world. On the other hand, it seems that two countries completely dominate it. So why is it their home markets are so large? Is it that technologically they're more advanced? Not really, because you know Russians have very advanced technologies in certain, um, in certain uh, industries. Indians have, Scandinavians have, Germans have, but somehow their, um, their firms have not managed to break into the top uh, 100. But that's a question, as I mentioned, that we are still searching the, um, the answer to. Um, the next set of questions, and I'll finish with, uh, with that that we try to uh, ask is, so if you're the government and you're observing this process, what are you worrying about? Uh, so you hopefully are not worrying so much about losing all the jobs and everybody being unemployed because we are showing you that you know, there is a balance or so new jobs are being created in new industries, uh, some old jobs are being uh, destroyed, so what do you worry about? And these are the three sets of issues that we um, discuss in the report. One is that, which is probably least questionable, which is whatever these technologies are, the people working at the, in these firms, in the technology firms, on average are much more educated than the rest of the labor force. So whatever the future holds, we don't know exactly which sectors are going to expand in the future relative to others, but the people working these sectors has much higher level of education than, uh, than um, kind of in the standard, uh, uh, standard economy. And that makes sense because robots replace routine tasks, and routine tasks typically, not always, but uh, most of them are sort of low-skill um, low uh, uh, tasks. Um, you know, telephone receptionist, truck driver, and so on. There are also some high skill, or what we now consider high skill um, workers, like accountants, lawyers, surgeons, for that matter, that actually technology can displace um, uh, well as well. Why? Because these are routine uh, jobs. So it becomes more about routine versus non-routine. Uh, non and a lot of the future of the humans in the workforce is about non-routine um, jobs. So one question, which we start answering, frankly, we don't answer particularly well, but uh, at least we um, try to uh, define it, is what sort of human capital and what sort of learning you, uh, you need for, um, for, for, for the future of, uh, of work. And for that reason, for the first time in this report, the World Bank develops a human capital index. In fact, that was slightly forced. Our president wanted to develop this human capital um, index anyhow. And uh, we convinced him that uh, the future of work is kind of a good uh, umbrella to think about what type of skills are, are necessary for the future. Uh, this is just the first uh, prototype, so we'll continue developing it over time. So it's relatively simple now. It basically asks the question, if a child is born today in any country around the world at age 18, so just as they're entering the labor force or going to universities, what is their accumulated human capital? And then further on, we uh, develop a simple method that says, well, to accumulate human capital, you first have to survive, because if you die early on, then unfortunately your human capital 
uh, goes away. So we take uh, into account statistics on survival of children. Then uh, you need to be healthy. So uh, to age 18 and actually beyond. So what is the basis for your health to be productive? And then you not only need to go to school, which is currently what a lot of um, academic studies take as a measure of um, human capital, which is the number of years that you went to school, but also what is the quality of your training. And the quality of your training or education we take from standardized international tests of, you know, how much did you learn in math, how much did you learn in hard sciences, in, um, in languages and so on. This is relatively imprecise, but it's uh, the first time that somebody puts for all countries uh, this data together. Um, and then, probably not very easy to see, but we come up with this human capital index for based on the latest available um, uh, data just to kind of uh, see which countries are uh, aware. And we put, it's not related to income per capita, but we put income per capita just so that you see the countries uh, better. Unlike, I should say, the United Nations Human Development Index that has existed for a number of years and specifically has income per capita in its make. Here it's all about your health and education at age 18 because this is the next uh, uh, generation of workers coming into the labor force. So what do you see? Top four countries come from East Asia. So Singapore, uh, Korea, Japan and Hong Kong. So probably not surprising. Uh, but still uh, something that is confirmed with this methodology as well. Then the next about 20, 25 countries are primarily European, uh, some East European as well, some countries from my uh, region. Um, then everybody can pick their favorite country and see how they do. India does quite badly, for example, not a surprise if you um, look at some of uh, the other indices, but the Indian government is super upset with this index. So they actually wrote a letter that said, this is so idiotic that we're actually going to ignore it. But then wrote, a s <laughs> you, can, you can search online, it's public, so it's a great letter. Um, because it says we're completely going to ignore you and then they write seven pages as to what's wrong and uh, you know, if you're going to ignore us, just say, this is idiotic, I ignore you forever. So I suspect they're not ignoring us. Um, but if you look at some of the countries, um, you can think of, because this is income per capita and human capital, you can think of an Im imaginary 45 degree line. And if you draw this imaginary 45 degree line, whoever is above the line, basically one way to interpret it is given their income per capita, their human capital is better than expected, if you like. So given their um, uh, investment, they do better. And whoever is below the 45 degree lines, Basically, they have, they're investing, but they're not getting returns. This is simplified, but um, to a first approximation works. So if you draw it this way, what do you see? So you see on that side, well, disregard Luxembourg, it's a specific case. But if you disregard Luxembourg, you see all of the Middle East, essentially. Uh, Saudi, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, and so on. So these are countries that are rich, that spend a lot on, on uh, education as well. But basically, they're not well educated. So somehow, a lot of money is wasted, um, is one way to say it. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, above the 45 degree lines, you see actually Cuba is a good representation, Vietnam, Moldova, Kyrgyz, Tajikistan, my own country, Bulgaria, China. Essentially, former centrally planned or former socialist uh, countries. Uh, and East Asian countries that were socialist, maybe still are socialist, do quite well, above, so to speak, their, uh, uh, their income per capita. At this point, we're not making much of it. We're just commenting that this is, uh, that this is, uh, uh, this is one of the trends. And then if you look uh, for uh, patterns across regions, there are no surprises. So basically, Africa does quite badly. Countries uh, in... Um, um, countries that have civil strife or have wars and so on do quite, uh, quite badly. Uh, I should say that uh, even though we present the latest data in the report, we have about 10 years of data going back for every country because this is more or less how many years you have good data on, uh, on learning. 
So these data are quite revealing. We'll soon make it uh, available as well because it can show, for example, a country like Vietnam that in a period of 10 years really zooms up. Because one hypothesis, which is I just told you, is that there was something about socialist countries, which is true, I come from an ex-socialist country, that spend a lot on health and education, and not surprisingly, 30 years after, they have good, um, uh, good outcomes. Uh, and that's probably true, but within these countries, there are also countries like uh, Vietnam that started relatively well, but really are zooming up, so they're doing something new. Uh, that works. And then on the negative side, you see countries like uh, Syria that in 2007, where the data, when the data starts, were above the 45 degree line. So given their income per capita, they actually have had quite good health and education system. War starts in a period of 10 years. Syria basically is off the chart. So it no, n nose dives uh, very, very significantly. What what this human capital index does not uh, uh, yet measure, but we'll try to do it in the next three years, which, which was the starting point. What are the skills that you need for the future of work? How do you work with technology? What we measure now are sort of fundamental skills, very important, because if you don't know how to read and write, uh, then you're not going to be able to work with technology. The next big challenge for us is how to make this more sophisticated. One way to make it more sophisticated, I was presenting this to um, uh, university students in Beijing, and this was the most exciting slide, so they wanted to take pictures of this slide. Um, so one thing, if you think about, about um, education, the same is true actually for health, so what's missing from a good human capital index? Most people say immediately, well, what you're missing is university education. It's super important and, you know, the level of universities um, determines then what jobs you get and so on. And that's true. So universities are important. Currently, there is no good data. Nobody has data beyond some very basic uh, measurements of, you know, Shanghai 500 and so on, on water quality universities. But we don't have a universal measure that tells you for every university student what is kind of the um, quality of education that they get at the, uh, at the tertiary education level. So we need to work on that. But research-wise, the most exciting uh, developments are actually in the 0 to 3, which is what I'm showing you, or 0 to 6 um, uh, ages, so before you go to school, preschool uh, area. Why? Because there is a lot of um, mostly neuroscience uh, and uh, neuropsychology uh, research that comes to, uh, to us in economics that basically says, in a way it's very deterministic, it basically says, at age six, I can tell you, given the brain development, so this is age three, and that also actually is a pretty good uh, determinant, but at age six, if I take an M MRI, this is an actual MRI of a human brain, at age three of a well-fed, healthy child, and you see how, how well his brain is, uh, these are two boys, how well his brain is developed, and then on the left-hand side, a child that has about 80% of the necessary nutrients, not half, not a third, 80%. So basically 20% less, if you like, fed is not the right word, but less nutrients by 20%. So that may be because they were undernourished. It may be because they don't have the right diet. So they actually eat a lot, but it's not the right uh, diet. And you can see just this 20% difference in essentially their... Uh, food and water, I should say, what a huge difference it makes on brain, brain development. So there are a number of studies, not in many countries, but in a few countries that basically follow kids over time to age three and then to age six, and essentially say, at age six, I can tell you how this child will succeed in life. So we can tell you not just how well they're going to study, we're going, we can tell you about their social development. We can basically tell you about their development as individuals. Uh, and since there are such studies in some of the Scandinavian countries, there are such studies in some Latin American countries, a few studies in uh, Africa, a lot in, um, uh, in the US. Uh, and actually it started in the US basically to study, uh, how to put it politely, uh, well, um, different from normal behavior. Um, uh, so there is about a 40, 40 years uh, literature in that regard, which is very deterministic. What it says to us is that we need to pay a lot more attention to the both health and education development very early. 
And in that area, there's almost no research. I mean, there's some research from a few countries that I mentioned, but there's no data across country. So this is where the World Bank, my organization, is going next. Basically, trying to develop the same tests that exist at the high school level and actually at the primary school level for three to five year olds. It's going to be a huge data collection exercise, uh, but we are quite excited about it. And here are some uh, five year olds in, um, in uh, a Chinese, um, uh, Chinese school. To show you this a different, uh, a different way, um, and, and this is kind of at a much uh, much more basic level. So stunting means that you're one standard deviation. So if a kid is stunted at age five, it means that uh, that their uh, nutritional quality or uh, development is one standard deviation away from the normal. So this is kind of a much mu much more lower bound than what I showed you before. So if you ask the question, where are the regions that we should be most concerned? Well, we knew about Africa. It shows up. But notice also South Asia. And the reason that South Asia is important is that in the discussion of global trade trends, both economic as well as um, international trade, it's often kind of predicted that after China gets richer, or is getting richer, then Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, and so on, will take on a lot of the manufacturing and service sector from China. And that's not happening. Why is that not happening? This is not the only reason, but this is clearly a factor, which is that they just don't have the basis for developing their, uh, their human capital. Um, I'm nearly done. There are a number of other facts that we um, document that, uh, well, are either worrying or try, or try to explain um, uh, how the future of work may, may affect uh, society. One fact that for me uh, was particularly surprising was the share of informal workers in the current global workforce. So what's inform an informal worker? So an informal worker is somebody that doesn't have a true contract. So basically, you may work somewhere, but if I ask you, show me your contract on paper, they say, I don't have a contract with the employer. We've just agreed. I don't get paid on a regular basis. I don't have social insurance, meaning health insurance. I don't have pension insurance. This has been an issue in development for many, many years. This is not a new topic. Hernando de Soto, among others, 30 years ago talked about this in the context of Latin America. And this is actually one of the reasons why the Doing Business Project was established, to reduce informality. And we thought that we are reducing informality tremendously over the last 30 years or so. This is the first time that the World Bank puts a large database of about 2,000 household surveys and labor uh, surveys not asking businesses what, uh, whether they're formal or informal, there are such studies as well, but asking workers or, or, or basically families. You know, you go to the family and ask a number of health, education, and so on, income questions, but you also ask them, where do you work? Can you show me your contract? Uh, you know, are you part of a labor union? And so on. And from that, we come up with this, uh, with this measure. It's one of the bigger data-related uh, contributions to the report. And the measure, to me, is startling. It basically says two out of every three workers in non-OECD countries are informal. They don't have a social, uh, sorry, they don't have a labor contract. Why is this particularly striking? Because it means that they also don't have any social protection, meaning no pension, no health insurance, no vacation, so they're kind of on their own. They don't exist in the labor statistics. This is worrying on the one hand, because it means that whatever government policies currently exist, they don't touch uh, uh, these people. But on the positive side, and we have a number of um, examples, about two dozen examples across countries, new technology now can reach these people that previously was not possible. Why? Because if you think of the standard model of social protection in rich countries, it, basically, it actually comes from Germany, from Otto von Bismarck 150 years ago. Basically, their logic was, you know, there are too many people, but there are few firms. So if we can provide social protection for firms, since you work for a firm, so I basically organize my taxation and social protection policy through the firm. So they pay you a wage, and on top of this wage, let's say, I charge them and you 30% for, for health insurance and 20%, let's say, for... Um, for your pension. So this is how I accumulate the resources necessary for um, social protection. 
And that's fine, it works reasonably well for a number of rich countries, but it's never actually worked in the developing world because so many people are informal. But now new technologies, particularly digital payments, e-wallets, can resolve this issue not through firms and where you work, for, but from your consumption. So there are a number of examples that we give from Mexico, from Kenya, from um, some states in India, in Bangladesh, um, uh, Guatemala, and so on, where basically you do the following. You say, I don't know where you work, but if you use online payments to, do your, to basically buy your grocery and your gas and so on, we can have a voluntary contract where on every dollar that you spend on consumption, we, you will put, let's say, two cents automatically into a separate uh, part of your e-wallet, and the government will match it. And that would be your health insurance. And you would put one cent for pension, and the government will match it with one percent, and so on. So in that way, you actually don't, know, don't need to know where people work. You just need to know where they uh, consume. As I mentioned, this is very new. So there are a number of um, about two dozen pilots, I would say, around the world that are trying to do this. But so far, at least, it's quite promising. In countries where e-payments, digital payments are um, uh, popular, that means that they have to have you know, Wi-Fi and internet and so on. So you have to have a certain sophistication of the infrastructure for digital payments. Otherwise, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't uh, work. And then you can build a kind of a stronger social protection system on it. There are a number of other exciting things, but since my time is long up, I'll finish here. Thank you.